We're going to be in Acts chapter 19. If you'd like to be turning over there. Acts chapter 19, we'll start in verse 8. We have a bit of an introduction that will seem like a sermon. Then we've got four truths and a challenge at the end. And you say, but Jay, it's eating meeting day. I will do my best. But uh, there's some good stuff I want you to have today. Chapter 19, beginning in verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all of the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So he has similar results as to the other places where he's been. He goes to the synagogue and he has limited success. Some people want to listen. Some people don't want to have anything to do with it. Eventually, that relationship becomes so sour that he decides to just stop trying the synagogue route, do something different. And so they begin to meet in a place called the School of Tyrannus. Now, in those days, when you think school, don't think uh, four walls and people meeting inside. They were typically large sets of steps, porticos. And people would gather together in those places and a particular teacher or a group of teachers would have their disciples there and they would teach them the things they wanted them to know. It was more open air type of school. So if people came by and wanted to hear what Paul was saying, they could just pick a, a seat and sit down and learn the things that he was teaching. And in that way, the message began to spread wider and wider. When you get to the book of Revelation, do you remember that Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. Well, Ephesus is in Asia Minor. So a lot of those congregations that John addresses, that Jesus addresses through John in the Revelation, uh, were probably folks who had listened to the message of Paul or who had been approached by somebody who had listened to the message of Paul. So we have kind of a centralized location at Ephesus, and the message is going out uh, from there all over Asia Minor. Uh, from Ephesus, Timothy ministers uh, in the future. From Ephesus, John, the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, uh, worships and uh, ministers in the future. So John is setting the groundwork for a whole lot of growth and a whole lot of conversions that were going to happen in that area. I want to mention two things really quick that are not in this passage that I find interesting. Number one, there's no mention of Sunday worship. We assume that they were meeting on the Lord's Day. We assume that they were taking the Lord's Supper, as that seems to have been the practice of all the churches in uh, the New Testament, all of those in particular that Paul was associated with. Same thing's true in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, it says they continued in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. But it doesn't say when. We assume that they were meeting on Sundays and that they were taking the Lord's Supper together, but we don't have that mentioned. The reason that I bring that up is that the growth that was going on in Ephesus that was spreading out to all these other places in Asia Minor was not due to Paul being a preacher in the pulpit on a Sunday. This wasn't because people were showing up for worship, hearing the message, and being converted. Most of the people converted in the New Testament, most of the people that are converted that I've ever been around in my life, are not converted in church. They're converted outside of the walls of this building. They're converted by the lives of people who get them interested and then tell them about the gospel. It's not about church as far as reaching out to the lost. Paul was in a place that was accessible. People could come to him where he was. And so he taught and those that he taught went out and taught as well. So we don't see any mention of the local assembly on Sunday, but we're sure that that was going on as well. The other thing that's interesting to me is that this group is never known as the Church of Christ. What's their name? 
They're the way. We run across that all through Luke's writings in Acts, uh, especially early on. Paul goes out because he's persecuting members of the way. Well, here he's on the other side of the persecution. He is uh, teaching the people in Ephesus, and there are people who are maligning the way. They're speaking evil about the work that Paul is doing. The term the way is used far more often in the New Testament to refer to the church than is the term church of Christ. Do you like the term church of Christ? I do. I think it's pretty descriptive of who we're trying to be. We are the church that belongs to Christ. Uh, Paul uses that description in Romans, and so it's a good New Testament reference. But understand, it, the name does not make us who we are. We make the name what it is. We are disciples that follow Jesus. We are the church that belongs to Christ. And so it's a descriptive term on the sign to help people understand who we are and who we're trying to be, but we also are members of the way. We're following the way, the truth, the life. So, well, I got to wondering if this was just a Luke thing. Is it only in Acts where the church is referred to this way? So I reached out to some of my preacher friends who know stuff, and one of them wrote back and said, check 2 Peter chapter 2. So if you will, run over there. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Peter says, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. So it seems that Peter used terms like that to refer to us as well. We are members of the way. We are members of the church that belongs to Christ. We are members following the way of truth. So all of those things uh, apply to us as well. All right. Well, that's your introduction. Now let's move on to four uh, quick truths, and we'll end with a little take-home assignment. Beginning in chapter 19 and verse 11. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew greatly in power. All right, truth number one. These guys who were trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. The problem was not with Paul. Paul was casting out demons himself, had done so. And he did so in the name of this Jesus that he preached. And Paul was not the problem. Think about the demon-possessed girl at Philippi. She's following them around from place to place. And she keeps saying, these are servants of the Most High God, and they're here to show you the way of salvation. Finally, Paul has all of that he wants, and he turns around and he casts the demon out of the girl. Could Paul cast out demons? Absolutely. Paul did it more than once. It was something that he was capable of doing. The problem in this scenario is definitely not Paul. Um, truth number two, the problem was not with the demons. Demons were well aware 
of the power that Jesus held. Let me remind you of a couple of things. First of all, Jesus got off the boat in the region of Gadara, region of the Gadarenes, and there was a guy who lived in the tombs. Remember this guy? He cut himself with stones. They would tie him up to try to keep him out of people's way, to keep him from hurting himself or anybody else, and he would just break the things that they tied him with, and he would be right back out there the next day. Jesus gets off the boat, and the man comes running out of the tombs, and the man addresses Jesus, What do we have to do with you, Jesus, you son of the Most High God? Have you come to torture us before it's time? That's a pretty good introduction, isn't it? His disciples at that point had never said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. The first being to name Jesus as the Son of the living God in the New Testament is a bunch of demons living in a crazy guy that lives in the tombs. They knew exactly who Jesus was. So when these seven sons of Siva said, I want to cast you out in the name of Jesus, the one that Paul preaches... The demons knew who Jesus was. He wasn't the problem. Paul, they had heard of. They were probably a little sketchy on Paul because they were afraid he might come around because he preached Jesus. So Jesus we know and Paul we know. But who are you? Look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Here's a good challenge for all of us concerning our faith. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. Someone will say, You have faith, and I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. There are lots of folks in our community, folks in our culture, and if you ask them, do you believe that there's a God? They'll say, yes, we believe there is a God, but their lives don't reflect that knowledge. Their lives don't reflect any kind of fear or respect for God. <coughs> the demons who were in that man at Gadara were scared of Jesus, respectful of Jesus. James says, all of the demons know who God is. And at least they're afraid. So many in our culture today use the name of the Lord flippantly. They talk about Him <clears throat> as if He were one of us. And we can just make fun as we please. The problem certainly was not with the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. How powerful is the name of Jesus? Well, it was powerful enough that when Peter was preaching that first sermon, he says, I want you to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. When they were casting out demons, they were doing it in the name of Jesus. When they were healing the sick, when they were uh, raising the dead, all of this was being done in the name of Jesus, by the authority, through the power of of Jesus. Look at Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 5. In your relationships with each other, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Some translations say something to be grasped or held on to. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even a death on a cross. And because of that, God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no name higher 
There is no name with more power. There is no name that carries with it more authority. And the demons that the sons of Siva were trying to cast out knew that. We know who Jesus is. We would respond to the authority of Jesus. Our only question is, who are you? Who, what makes you think that you can sling about the name of the Lord of Lords and that we will respond? Truth number four, the problem was that they were calling on a name that they didn't know. They were calling on a deity that they didn't worship. They were calling on a Lord that was not Lord over their lives. They were pretending to go out on behalf of someone who had not sent them out. They were just winging it and hoping that maybe that name would do something good for their reputation, for their lives. Again, we've got a lot of folks in our culture today who are not subject to the Lord, but they want to use the name of the Lord. They're not subject to what Christ has called us to be or how he's called us to live, but they want the benefits of what Jesus might do for them. And so we get all kinds of wild and wonderful religion that bases, it, uh, bases itself in the idea that if you'll just ask God what you want through Jesus, God will give it to you. It doesn't really matter if you're being faithful. It doesn't really matter if you're part of His family. It doesn't really matter if you're living your life for Him because really God's just a big candy store and you tell Jesus what you want and He gives it to you. Seven sons of Siva could testify that's a bad way to live your life. They called on these demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preached to come out. And in response, the demon-possessed individual jumped on them, and beat them up, and sent them home naked and wounded. One demon-possessed guy, seven sons of Siva. You might have liked their odds at the beginning of the fight. But by the time it was over, the demon-possessed man had absolutely wreaked havoc on their lives. And they became the jumping-off point for changes in other people's lives who were living a little bit like they were. Did you notice that there was a book burning? I bet Beth cringed when we read that. Book burnings are not her favorite thing. Uh, they brought together the scrolls that they had gathered together on the dark arts and they burned them and they took and, and uh, the amount that they were worth was in today's money somewhere around $3.5 million worth of literature that they burned in that bonfire because they didn't want to have anything to do with demonology. They didn't want to have anything to do with the dark arts anymore. They wanted to know about Jesus. So God takes this horrible thing that happens to the sons of Siva and turns it to the advantage of the way. He turns it to the advantage of Paul and the truth tellers that were in Ephesus at the time. So here's our take home. Make sure that your faith is your own. Not your mama's faith. Not your daddy's faith. Not grandma and grandpa, not the preacher, not the elders, not your Bible class teacher, not your friend down the street. Make sure that your faith is your own. That when you call on God in the name of Jesus Christ, that He's your Lord, your Savior, your Master, not somebody else's. There's a difference in how Jesus uses His authority in His family and outside His family. And there will come a time when we enter into judgment when it will make all the difference in eternity whether He is our Savior or just someone else's. Don't rely on the Jesus that someone else preaches. You own a New Testament. If you don't, I've got spares. Read about Jesus for yourself. 
If you have questions, ask somebody. There are other people who have like faith and who maybe have a little more knowledge about Scripture, who maybe have studied that passage before. Maybe they've been walking with Christ for longer. Maybe they have stories they can tell. Maybe they have uh, examples they can share. But make sure that your faith is based on what you know, not just on what somebody else says is true. Again, in our culture, there are lots of experts on Scripture. They say a lot of different things. No Scripture. And then allow someone else to assist you, but don't let them be the only voice in your head when you think about your Savior. Seek Jesus for yourself. And if we can help you do that, we want to. It may be that this morning you're here, and you've been seeking and you've been finding things about Jesus that you like. There's a lot to love about Jesus. And maybe you've decided you need to change where you've been and move in a different direction in your life. We can help you with that. If you have questions, we can help you find the answers in Scripture. If you know what you need and you want help doing it today, if you want to put Him on in baptism, if you need the prayers of the church on your behalf, just let us know what it is that we can do to help you make sure that Jesus is the Lord of your life. And we will do everything we can to help you.